Well, let's talk about prayer for a few minutes tonight. I often tell people, and I can't get anything accomplished without prayer. And I, you know, that's not an exaggeration. I guess I could get up if you wanted to, me just to say, could I get up? Could I do things? Could I go through the day without prayer? Yeah, but it doesn't mean that I would get accomplished what I needed to get accomplished. And secondly, there is something inside of me every day that calls me to prayer, that calls me to want to be in the presence of God and to worship Him. And thirdly, I've been very fortunate. I've been very blessed. I was just talking to a group of people about this in, in a session I was leading the other day. I've been very blessed. I've been around the world, and in every culture that I've ever been in, people pray. They don't always pray to God, but there is something in us. We have been created to want to have fellowship with God. Now, let me just give you kind of a prime illustration of what happened in my own personal devotions this, this morning. As I was reading the Bible, I went back to, to the book of Genesis to chapter 3, and I just wanted to meditate for a moment on the fact that God came walking in the garden in the cool of the evening. Isn't that a beautiful picture? That God's walking, and he's calling out to Adam and Eve. He wants fellowship with them. He's walking in his creation. And I, I just, for a moment, I just kind of separated what I knew was the rest of the story that's painful, and that's not what I want to talk about tonight, but the fact that God was wanting to commune with the people that he had created and he loved. And as I sat there praying and thinking about that, it dawned on me, God is still walking the face of this earth. God is, spirit is moving, and God calls people to fellowship. And tonight, I hope that you will take these seven daily themes and that you will grow. Prayer is not, listen, prayer is not an option for us. Jesus taught us to pray. Jesus was the model of prayer. But let me give you what I think are seven specific themes that you could adopt, maybe the first one on Monday, pray the seventh one on Sunday, or you can do what I do. I need to pray these every day of my life. And you don't have to spend a lot of time on these themes, but you do need to just prayerfully come to the Lord with those. Number one, pray your purpose. Pray your purpose in life. Every one of us, God has a God-given purpose in our life. And when I pray about my purpose in life, I give God thanks for that. I am so grateful that I have a purpose for living. I'm so grateful that I don't only have a purpose for my life, I have a purpose for my home, a purpose for my ministry or your vocation, however you want to say that. There's purpose even in this ministry tonight in what we're doing. Look at what the Bible says. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, notice that, the goal of the prize of the upward call. He's pressing for that. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, and have this in mind, and I have a feeling if you're watching on Wednesday night, I'm speaking to a mature group, having this in mind, and if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we've already attained, let us walk by the same rule, and let us be of the same mind. What's he saying there? He's saying, personally, I want to press, but he's saying, as a church, as a church, there was a purpose for the church. And every church has the same core purposes, but not every church has the same way of expressing those core purposes. And so I give God thanks. I never want to forget my vision. I never want to forget my purpose, but I never want to let the church forget his purpose. And there are occasionally times throughout the year, like I had a conversation with one of my sons over the phone today, where I remind them of the purpose, their God-given purpose in life. Because when you forget your purpose, it's like forgetting an anchor on a boat and you just begin to drift in life. Also, look at this next verse of Scripture. Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven. Now, think about that. As a U.S. citizen, when I travel, I want to live a life that is exemplary so people think the world of, my nation, of, our, of our nation. I remember I was preaching in Greece one time, and after the service, I was doing like we do here on Wednesday nights. I was having conversation and good Turkish coffee with them that night. And um, one of the men there said to me, he says, have you ever been to Texas? And I go, yeah, a number of times. He goes, Texas must be like heaven. 
And I didn't want to pop his bubble, Texas, to me. no offense to my Texan friends, but, you know, kind of hot and muggy in parts of Texas, and then it's kind of really dry in parts of Texas with lots of rattlesnakes. So I said, why do you ask that question? He says, because all of the big churches and the great churches I see on TV coming from Texas. Well, he was hoping that I would tell him a lot about Texas, friends, as a citizen of heaven, I want to reveal God's love. I want to reveal God's plan, God's purpose. I don't want to just reveal, as a good citizen of the United States, our values on freedom and dignity, but I want to live as a citizen of heaven. How? Conducting myself in a manner worthy of the good news of Christ. That's much more worthy than the Constitution or Declaration of Independence. Then whether I come and see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose, circle that word purpose in your outline tonight, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. When we remember our purpose as a congregation, as a company, as a family, then we can stand together against anything that comes our way. And then I love what David prayed, Psalms 138 and verse 8, the Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Earlier today, somebody asked me about my ministry and being in ministry. And I told them, I said, you know, I began to experience the call of God very young in my life, but I just didn't think there was any way I could do that. And I've shared this with our church before, but I remember when I professed my, my, my sense that God had called me into the ministry all of a sudden, there were pastors and ministers telling me I could never preach the gospel. Number one, I didn't have the diaphragm for it. Number two, I didn't have the health for it. I remember my scholarship counselors uh, saying, you know, you could never do that. There's a lot of stress in ministry. And they went through all these negative things about ministry. And then I can remember uh, my guidance counselor talking to me. And they were right. In the natural, I could not have done that at, my point in, at that point in my life. But when God puts purpose in your life, it's not that I have fulfilled the call to the ministry. The Lord fulfills his purpose in our lives. And that's what we have to ling on. Never, ever, ever forget the supernatural presence of God. Some people love the Lord, but they do not expect the supernatural power of God to be manifested in their life. If God has called you, God will equip you and God will make a way. Number two, pray with perspective. Pray with perspective. Oh, I love this one. You see, I need perspective in my life. I need perspective in marriage. I need perspective in ministry. I need perspective in age as I, as I get older in life. I need to have that perspective in life that comes from God, a heavenly perspective in life, to see God life from God's perspective. Look at this. And I love the way Eugene Peterson translates this in the message. Don't shuffle along. You ever seen somebody just kind of, you, you know, I don't know what it is about me, but I just want to smack them and say, come on, pick them up and let's go. Don't shuffle along, eyes to the ground, absorbed with the things right in front of you. Look up. Be alert to what's going on around What's going on around Christ? That's where the action is. See things from his perspective. The closer I stay to Jesus, the more I can see things from his perspective. So when I pray, I not only ask God to help me remember my purpose, I not only thank him for my purpose, but I also ask God to fulfill his purpose in my life, in our marriage, in our family, with our children and grandchildren, in our congregation and in our community. And to see things from God's perspective, I have to be able to see people with God's eyes. Because I'll be honest with you, sometimes when I first look at people, I wish I could tell you my thoughts were more godly or more patient than what they are. So I'm constantly saying, God, help me to see this individual with your eyes. There are people around you tonight. There are people around you when you go to work tomorrow, in your subdivision, wherever you live, they desperately need the love of God. They desperately need the love of God. That's why we often refer to Woodland not just being as a church of saints, but we're a hospital for sinners. Everybody that walks through the doors of our church, we want to be able to answer the question, yes, we will love you, and yes, we will accept you. 
We're not in the business of saving people. Jesus is in the business of saving people. I ask the Lord to help me see my future through his eyes, get his perspective on my future. And I'm at that point in life right now as I get older, I definitely need his perspective. I want to I fulfill his plan for me as I get older. And let me just say this. I want to get better, not bitter. I want to get sweeter, not sour. And that's so important in life. And that perspective doesn't come from having money. It doesn't come from having security. That perspective comes from seeing that God is in control. So ask God to help you see your neighbors, your coworkers, your personal ministry, whatever it is that you do in life. Now, the reason that I need God's perspective is this, so I can make wise decisions. That's why I need I need his perspective so I can make wise decisions. So I don't get caught up in things that don't matter. You would be stunned at how much stuff comes across my desk every day. I had 47 phone calls yesterday. That's a lot of phone calls. That's a lot of time on the phone, okay? Thank God for earpods, airpods, whatever you call them, because that's a lot of talking on the phone. I have got to be able to make wise decisions and not allow myself to get up caught in things that really don't matter. I need God to help me to see me from his perspective. Why? So that I don't get proud because pride will puff you up. I love the way the King James Version says it. Pride will puff you up. And if I'm puffed up with pride, I'm going to make bad decisions. But I also need God to help me see myself as he sees me so that guilt doesn't tear me down so that guilt doesn't tear me apart and doesn't destroy my life. I was recently in a seminar about people wrestling and dealing with shame, and and I'm just so thankful. You know, I lived with shame because of my physical health so many years ago. As a matter of fact, one of our children recently overheard us talking about a certain scar in my life, and, and they go, Dad, you're kidding. I go, no, that's just part of the miracle of my health and of my life, and And they said, Dad, I never knew. But shame had me trying to always mask and cover up and never even talk about it. So you need God's perspective about your life, but you also need to pray. And this is a tough one. I'm just going to prepare you right now. Pray for patience. Pray for patience. One of the men in the church often comes up to me and says, Pastor, don't pray for patience. I promise you it's going to be hard if you pray for patience. Well, we all need patience. Because here's what I've learned in life. And take this from somebody that's been around the block a few times. When you're impatient, it's going to take you twice as long. Sometimes three times as long. The old saying, haste makes waste. You know, I I, I go to the grocery store and I do what you do. So I hope you don't look real spiritual at me. I look for the shortest, fastest line possible. You know, who seems to be checking out the quickest. I always... Siri just said she can hear me, so <laughs> I don't know what I said that called Siri up, but I always pick the slowest line. I get somebody, and we won't call any names, and all of a sudden, they've got this many coupons and things to give, and or there's just something else going on, and it just slows down the progress. So when I get impatient, now this is true, <laughs> this is true. When I get impatient, I try to do things my way. And boy, that always messes it up. When I get impatient, I, if I get impatient writing a sermon, if I get impatient in prayer, if I get impatient in a leadership decision, I'll find myself trying to do it my way. And so I pray for patience. God, help me to remember my purpose. Lord, help me to keep your perspective. Help me to remember you're large and in charge and help me to have patience. And what I have learned is you can find joy in waiting upon the Lord. You ought to write that down because I didn't put that in your outline. You can find joy in waiting upon the Lord. Those that wait upon the Lord, they shall renew their strength. They shall rise up with wings like an eagle. And you can really find joy. I've discovered that. It was hard for me to discover, but I discovered that. Let's look at Galatians 6, 9. Let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. You see, God's time is the right time. God knows more. God sees further. God knows what's down the road. 
I've often wondered, <laughs> why was it so long for the Messiah, for Jesus Christ to be born? Why hasn't he come back yet? I want him to come back so bad. I long for the return of Jesus Christ. I'm going to be talking about that in just a couple of weeks, so you want to be sure and be with us for that. So here are some things that I pray for. I pray for patience with myself. I pray for patience with my family. I pray for patience with my ministry. COVID has really thrown a wrench in how we do things and people's coming to church and how we do church. And I find myself, Lord, help me to be patient as, as we still are in the process of, of gathering everybody back in. Who's going to come back? Who's not going to come back? I find myself praying, Lord, help me to be patient and not be impatient with those who are helping me to lead in our church and lead in our community. I was reading some staggering statistics about anger in families. Do you know anger is tearing apart more families than financial problems are tearing them apart? And the reason anger is, the reason for a lot of anger is impatience. Because when we get impatient, I should high five the woman in front of me with that many coupons. I really should. She's been a good steward of her money. She's been a good steward for her family. But I'm important. I need to get through that line. I need to pay for my coffee so I can go home and get a cup, you know? And so impatience will make you make bad decisions. Fourthly, we want to pray for perseverance. You say, isn't that about the same as patience? No, it's a big difference. Praying for perseverance. Let me give you another stat tonight. Do you know that 80% of pastors will not be in ministry 10 years from now? I pray for the church, not just our church, but I pray, pray for the church at large. In our denomination, we don't have bishops. We have district superintendents and a general superintendent. And I've recently sat down with some of them, and they've all asked me, talked to me about the same thing. People are just, pastors are giving up, ministers are giving up. It's, this is a difficult time to lead, but it's a difficult time for everybody, you know? It's a difficult time for the shipping industry. It's a difficult time for dispatchers. It's a difficult time for police officers. It's a difficult time for everybody. But if everybody started giving up, we would have a total societal collapse, and if you give up on your children, if you give up on your marriage, or if you give up on your community or your church, friends, I can't begin to tell you just how important it is that God has called us to persevere. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. Our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. Just a couple of hours ago, a man from our congregation went to be with Jesus. And, you know, I just broke down and wept. Oh, sweet man, kind man, good man. He's had a lot of trouble in his life. We've talked numbers of times about the problems and challenges he's had in his life. But this message already brewing in my spirit, I just thought and prayed over him. Those, pro those troubles now seem so small and tiny to him because he is in the presence of Jesus Christ. Paul tells young Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, 11, pursue righteousness. Pursue righteousness and a godly life. And how does he tell him to do it? Along with faith, we talked about that Sunday morning, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Circle that word in your outline, perseverance. How do we pursue righteousness? We pursue it with perseverance. And then fifthly, pray for purity. Pray for purity. When I talk to our students sometimes and they ask me about sexual purity and, and I enjoy having those conversations, I even told the church, I told you just a few weeks ago, I said, you know, I remember when I was young, I used to think, I'll be so glad when I get in my 50s and I don't have strong sexual drives anymore. And, you know, I just used to think that all of that went away. It didn't take me long in the ministry to discover that elderly people, you know, they have just as many problems with sexual purity as anybody else does. Now, I can tell you stories that will make you chuckle. Number one, because of the people that I know who own, you know, retirement facilities and nursing homes. Here's what I'm trying to say to you. There are, there's an ongoing battle of sexual purity in our culture today because the sex-obsessed culture that we came out of 
now is no longer attracted to beauty. It's just attracted to what I want to satisfy my, my desires right now. And with the advent of online pornography, you know, when a, when a granddaughter comes to me and tells me she's found pornography on her grandfather's phone and she's crying and I hold her and pray for her. When a grandson comes to me, or excuse me, when a son comes to me and says he's found compromising things on his mama's phone, I'm going to tell you folks, those are not the kind of conversations and the trials you want to have to go through. So pray every day, keep me pure, keep me true. Psalm 86, 11, teach me your ways, O God, that I may live according to your truth. Grant me purity of heart so that I may honor you. You see, as I honor the Lord, I will honor my wife, I will honor my children and grandchildren, I will honor this church. That's why Jesus has to be first in everything. Look at 2 Corinthians 6, 6. We prove ourselves by our purity. Underline that. Don't just circle that word tonight. We prove ourselves by our purity. That flies right in the face of a world that says, I don't care how you are, how you live morally, as long as you can get this, this, and that done. Friends, I got to tell you something. You can test the character of a man and a woman and their ultimate success by their purity. If you don't believe me, look at the football coach that's embarrassed his whole team. Look at the sports guy that's embarrassed his whole industry. Look at the media people who have embarrassed their industries. Look at presidents who have embarrassed us in the White House. I could just go to look at pastors that have failed. Look at school teachers that have failed. Purity is important. And you may be able to do everything just right, but we are not machines. We are human beings created in the image of God. So we prove ourselves by our purity. But purity is something I pray for. I pray for purity of desire, purity of heart, purity of mind. I made a covenant with my wife when I married her. I wrote it in our vows. I pledged you not only to be faithful with my body, but to be faithful with my mind. Run. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, 18. Run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. And then finally, Matthew 5, 8. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. Listen, that's one of the great promises of what we call the Beatitudes. But hear me tonight. If I can't see God, I can't lead. If I can't see God... I can't preach. If I can't see God, I can't love my wife and lead my family the way I should. If I can't see God, I can't make the kind of contributions that I'm called upon to be in this community. I mean, there are things that I'm a part of that there's no prayer, there's no invocation that I volunteer to serve in, but... I'm there by divine assignment. I believe that with all my heart. I didn't ask for it. I've been asked. And by praying, I'm able to bring, hopefully, godly perspective and godly leadership to that. And then number six, pray for power. Pray for power. You know, I need the power of God. One of my um, favorite illustrations that I love to use when it comes to power and authority, it's one thing to have authority. It's another thing to have the power for that authority to work. So my illustration is this. Imagine that you're a police officer in downtown Detroit, okay? You're downtown Detroit, and all of a sudden, there's one of these big, I don't even know if they allow them in downtown Detroit, but they're here in our community. They, they allow one of these 42-wheel trucks with big rolls of steel upon it. I've talked to the truck drivers who drive. I never saw anything like that until I moved to Michigan. I've talked to the truck drivers, and, you know, they tell me we can't stop for red light sometime. And they've even told me, says, Pastor Clanton, always look before you take off from a red light. Because if we stop, that light, we don't see that light, and it turns, says that steel is going to roll right forward over our cab and right out over the car. So I always take time to look. But imagine you're a police officer. You have the authority to say stop. But you don't have the power to stop that big truck. As a matter of fact, you don't have the power to stop a subcompact little hybrid car. But when you walk in the power of God, you have the power to stop the devil in his tracks. You have the power to cast out demons. 
You say, Pastor, do you believe that kind of thing still happens? Yes, I do. I don't think I, you know, you see it all the time, but I think there are times when you have to do that. God not only gives you authority, he gives you power. Look at 2 Corinthians 1.8. We think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. And we thought we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die. But as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely only on God who raises the dead. You may be going through something tonight that you're just thinking, I don't have the power. God's given you authority, but you don't have the power. Look to him tonight. Pray for power. Ask for power. The early church did. They said, Lord, grant us boldness. Grant us power to preach the word. Grant us power to pray for the sick and see them recovered. Jesus told us we would receive power when the Holy Spirit came into our lives. You're not called to live as a powerless Christian. You're not called to live as a wimpy Christian. But you have to walk in the ways of the Lord. There were seven sons of a priest that they decided they would just try to imitate Paul. And when they tried to imitate Paul, they were soundly defeated and beat up by the power of evil. Now, Paul had authority and power. They maybe had authority by being the sons of a priest because under the Jewish law, they could have become priests themselves but they lack the power. And you can't just say, I'm a Christian, I have the power. You gotta pray for the power. You gotta trust God for the power. And you gotta walk in the ways of the Lord to experience the power. And then finally, pray for peace. Seven daily themes, or seven themes to pray once a day. Pray for peace. Now when I talk about peace, I'm not talking about the peace that comes into our hearts, that passes understanding. When we've been born again, I'm talking about the things that I can't control. Does anybody know what I'm talking about there? I find sometimes the things that stress me out is the things I can't control. And I, and I have to just back off and say, why am I losing my peace over this? Why is this causing me anxiety? I can't control what somebody else is going to do. I can't control somebody else's response. I, I can't, con there's a lot, just so much I can't control. The things I can control, I think it's why I love a remote control on the TV so much. And I especially love the kind that we have now where I can just tell it to do what I want it to do. Most of the time, it does what I say to do. Sometimes I have to ask for help with it. But I love those things I can control. The kind of TV I miss is the picture in a picture where I could watch two ball games at the same time. But my point is this. Things that I can control don't typically rob me of my peace. But the things that I can't, and there are many. It's why Paul tells us, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Now, he's writing to a persecuted group of Christians. He's writing to a group of people that's a struggling church. Tell God what you need. Thank him for all he's done. And then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds everything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. I'm going to tell you, there's nothing like a peaceful heart. There's nothing like coming home to a peaceful home. There's nothing like laying your head down with peace in your heart. There's nothing like coming into a board meeting or coming into uh, your office or coming into your class with a peaceful heart. There may be things you can't control around you, but you have the peace of God that passes understanding. You have the power of God. And God is teaching you patience. And God is giving you his perspective. You see, when you pray for these seven daily themes, listen, when you pray for these things, God is going to answer your prayer. And you say, Pastor, how can you be so sure? Because the word says... If we ask anything in his name, according to his will, this is a confidence that we have. It will be done. Come on, Victory. That's good stuff. All right, let's pray together. Father, we love you. 
Tonight, I pray that you'll help your people not just to talk about prayer and not just agree that prayer is a good thing. I pray that at the same time that you'll deliver us, Lord, from a slavishness that just somehow or another, God, we feel like we just got to do our duty and get it done. But help us to delight in the call of God when you come walking through in the morning or in the evening, in the afternoon, whenever we pray. And that, God, we have the fellowship with you that you so desire with us. Teach us, Lord, how to pray. For it's in Jesus' name I ask. Amen, amen, and amen. Hey, God bless you so much. Thank you for joining us this evening. I hope that if you enjoyed this, please like and please share this tonight on Facebook and YouTube. And send me a comment or send me a question. If you're on Facebook, you can just send it to, to, to me or you can email it to info at woodland.church. I promise you we'll respond to you. And, uh, or if you know my phone number, you can send me a text message. And while we're having a conversation here, we'll try and respond to you as well. God bless. Good night.